So today we're looking at another way to see the way. And that has many possibilities, many implications. But a member of our YouTube audience, Tommy, from Sydney, Australia, asked this question. How do you interpret this verse? I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. It comes from John 14, 6. And I've actually spoken on this topic uh, many times over the years that I've been doing ministry, and it's uh, kind of amusing how I'm looking at it now in new ways, different ways. You think you understand something for a long time and hold that particular thought until uh, you get to the point where you don't uh, see it that way anymore. And I guess in some ways the, what I'm going to share with you today is uh, I have seen it that way, but I was always trying to put things in the training, in the context of the training I received from Unity and also from my Christian background, my traditional Christian background. There's always been a little bit of a struggle there. I've gone back into some of my earlier books that I've written and I can see pretty quickly how I was trying to speak to a specific audience, a unity audience, and I'm a unity minister, so that would that makes sense. But I agree 100% with Charles Fillmore when he said, I reserve the right to change my mind. And I embrace all that I've been taught in from uh, the wonderful unity, unity teachers I've had, the books, the individuals, ministers, different uh, people that have given me input. But the whole message of unity is to think for yourself, to tap your own inner guidance, your own inner wisdom. And if we are all designed to come up with the same thing, then what's the use of having us? What's the use of an individual? if we're all going to say the same thing. And we're not going to say the same thing. We're all facets, different facets of this infinite universe. So we want to listen to that, even if it takes us off the main path. Um, I have been, the, the book I'm currently working on has been one of the most uncomfortable presentations because I find myself wanting to say things about the traditional Christian approach that makes me a little bit nervous because it doesn't support the traditional Christian approach. And then I get to thinking, well, so what? The traditional Christian approach doesn't support my consciousness, doesn't support everything I'm coming up with. Am I obligated to put myself in that place and say, if I'm going to call myself a Christian, I've got to believe this and this and this. That's what's expected. Well, maybe I will just redefine Christianity because that's not what it means to me anymore. There's a difference in what the church taught and there's a difference in what I think Jesus taught. I'm a Jesus guy and not a biblical Jesus guy. You know the kind of Jesus guy I am because I've talked about this for a long time. There's a difference between what he said, what he taught, and what the church said he taught. The church is teaching what the church teaches. That is, the Gospels, Paul, the whole New Testament is a New Testament, is a mainstream Christian presentation. That's the context. We have to understand that. And the apostles, the um, again, Paul, who is probably one of the most influential writers of the Christian era, was really responsible for establishing much of the terminology we use in traditional Christianity. Never met Jesus, didn't know him. The one experience he had with him was in a vision on the road to Damascus. You're all familiar with that story. But he came up with a view of Jesus that is Jesus himself probably would not recognize. And we have to be okay with that. We have to be able to say something like that and know it's true. It probably is true. We can't absolutely prove it because we can't go back there and get into Paul's head and all that. 
the experience he had was profound because it changed the entire course of his life. So I give him that. But what I also understand is he came up, he was trained as a Pharisee. He put Jesus in the Pharisaic model, in the mainstream Jewish model, reinterpreted that to mean something else, became, started being called the New Covenant. But the New Covenant, when you look at all the elements in it, is exactly the same as the Old Covenant. It's just new words. A new way to say it is involves sacrifice, involves sin, involves separation from God. It's all the same thing. But the means to get back to God is what changes. The Old Covenant said, practice the law, and you'll be true to the law, and you'll be in good standing with God. The New Covenant says, accept Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. There's still something between you and God, something you have to do, something you have to align with. So what do you do with someone like Jesus who says the kingdom of God is within you? That would indicate there are no barriers. There's no place where God leaves off, really, and you begin. It's called oneness. It's called omnipresence. And so when I put things in that perspective, I realize I have no apologies to make if I say, in my experience, this doctrine that is held by mainstream Christianity no longer means anything to me. It doesn't apply because it's not based on universal truth. It's based on the early teachings of the church. And I'm not attacking or criticizing that at all. But I think it's done a lot of damage. I think it's helped keep people separate from a possible experience with their own indwelling Lord. But actually it hasn't. The only thing that keeps us from that experience is our own spiritual laziness. If we're not interested in pursuing that, if it doesn't mean anything to us, we're not going to pursue it, and that's okay. You can't lasso somebody, tie them down, and say, you're going to go within by tomorrow or, <laughs> or else. You can't do that. You can only present ideas. People will respond to them or they won't. The ones that respond, great. They respond because they're ready for something new. They're ready for the new wine. They're ready to throw out the old wineskins. As I said a couple weeks ago, you'll never see a mystic on your front porch with a Bible. They don't try to convert anyone. They are teachers. They're not preachers. The preacher is one who will try to convert. I'm a teacher. I'm not a preacher. I have never liked that designation. There was about a three-year-old boy one time that came into my office in a church in Missouri. And he said, he looked at me and he said, are you the creature? <laughs> I said, yes, <laughs> I am that, and I'm a few other things. Okay, so the first thing that we observe in this statement, this is very important for us that uh, are interested in opening our minds a little bit beyond what we've been told. The first thing we observe is that this passage makes the man Jesus the only way to the Father. This tells us that if the saying originated with Jesus, it has been Christianized. It is what I would call an example of a modified saying. So you would have an original saying, and then you would have the gospel writers come along and take an original saying and modify it slightly to fit his narrative. And in the book I'm working on, I list three kinds of sayings, and I've gone over these with you before, but a straightforward saying would be something that would sound like a mystic would say. It would express a spiritual principle that if you take it out of the gospel context, it would make sense to any mystic any time. Then you have a modified saying. That's what we're going to look at today. It's a saying that was probably taken from something Jesus originally said, but then was modified to fit into the mainstream narrative that the gospel writers were bound to. 
then there's a modified context. And that can be a straightforward saying, but put in a context that is modified to make it sound like the original saying was talking about the mainstream um, narrative. And if you think of the entire New Testament, it's a modified context. That's a New Testament context. It's the mainstream Christian context. Any writing that did not fit into that narrative was not admitted, was not allowed to get into it. So to get into it, it had to meet certain criteria. Jesus had to be the Son of God, had to be Savior of all sins, had to die and be resurrected, had to do, I don't know, several other things. Oh, uh, the return, going to be returning. All of these elements had to be included for it to make it in, otherwise it's, it ends up on the cutting floor. <laughs> Didn't make it in. And that would include all of the Gnostic writings, which is an entirely different view of Jesus. And sometime I'll, I'll get into a series on some of those ideas, because though they probably wrote later, Although uh, the Gospel of Thomas could be contemporary with, with the uh, Gospels, the, the Mark, the earliest Gospel, they don't know for sure. The scholars argue about the date on the Gospel of Thomas. A list of 114 sayings attributed to Jesus, some very profound, some very strange. But there was this group of people called Gnostics that had a completely different view of Jesus. They could care less about the resurrection, about this idea that he came to save the world from their sins and all that. He came to wake people up to their own indwelling spirit. That means their own inner uh, connection with God, the connection with the absolute. Completely different view of the role and purpose and identity of Jesus. Very fascinating. So we have a Christianized view. Uh, we have sayings probably that originated with Jesus, though there's no way we can tell, other than do they have that mystical ring to them? And this one definitely does, and I'll explain why. First place, a mystic would not call attention to himself as the way to the Father. How do we know? Because the recurring foundational principle a perennial truth embodied in the mystical tradition is that the Father, God the Absolute, is centered within every person. All of the mystical teachings in the world from the earliest, far, as far back as we can go to now, say the same thing. God is omnipresent, everywhere present equally at the same time, but most importantly is present in you. And the illustration I've used is you drop the sponge in the water, you know, the water being God or spirit is permeates that sponge. There's no place where the sponge, the water in the sponge leaves off in the, in the ocean or the water on the outside begins. There's its oneness. I'm in the Father. Sponge says, I'm in the water, but the water, the ocean, is greater than me. I'm in the Father, but the Father is greater than me. It makes perfect sense. Is he saying that just for himself? The Bible says, yes, he is. That's a modified context. A mystic would never say, only I have it. You don't. Or I have it and I can give it to you. They don't say that either. They can't. If I'm in the Father, you're in the Father as well. But if you have a belief system that says God is up in the sky someplace, that's how you're going to approach the whole problem. And you're going to pray to a father up in the sky, or a father, mother, whatever you want to call it. You're going to pray to something outside of yourself to come and make a change in your life. And that's what most... 99% of organized religion is about. God's out there someplace. I'm here. I've got a problem. God has the answer. I need to make a connection. How do I do it? Everyone has a system. The truest system, the 
system the mystic will say is, you are the temple of the living God. If you want to make that connection, you go within yourself. The trouble is, it's the most challenging thing you'll probably ever do. It is not easy to talk about. It's not easy to convey the experience that comes when you actually make that connection. But we can just say that it's there and encourage people to turn within the best way they know and try to open themselves to that. But the encouraging thing about this is, why did you step off your traditional path? Because you are listening to that voice already. You're listening to that inspiration already. The fact that you stepped off that path is proof that you are aware. There's something greater than what you've been taught at work in your life right now. Jesus was not calling attention to himself, but to the way he taught. And followers of Jesus, as I've pointed out many times, were called followers of the way. I like to think that's the name Jesus gave his teachings because it makes the, the uh, verse where the passage we're dealing with today make more sense. Jesus was not calling attention to himself, but to the way that he taught. The way was the name given to his body of teachings because he put none of his teachings in writing. He truly was the embodiment of the way. Had he written everything down, he could have held up the manuscript and said, this is the way, the truth that I have taught. If you follow these teachings, you will see they lead you to life, to the very Father within. So his saying, I am the way, would be like me saying, I'm the way. Everything I've written in all the books that I have written, if I had all that information just in my head, I would say, the way I'm teaching is the way. You know, it's all here. I am that. It doesn't exist outside of me. But now that I have written things down, I can hand you a book and say, here's some of the ideas I have taught. I can give you that in a different way. It's not me personally. Yes, I wrote the book. It's my ideas being projected. But the whole idea of a book is to, as you read it, it's to stimulate the same level of inspiration in you. That's what every good book has done for me. It has stimulated something that was just below the surface. And I highlight that because I believe it already. I believed it before I read it. And that's very important because the guidance is happening at this very moment. But Jesus was probably illiterate. Some scholars think he could probably read. Very few think he could write because it was not common that people read and write. They say about 1% of the population at that time. But I also wonder, I mean, he could have gotten a secretary like Paul used a secretary, somebody who, as he spoke, somebody would quickly write. They had a talent of writing down what was being said. And he actually used that. And Jesus probably could have done that as well. But my suspicion is that that would not have been good enough in his mind that people still would not have gotten it. His teaching ultimately was you have to experience the Holy Spirit. You have to experience the wholeness of spirit yourself to understand what I'm teaching and then let it be your individual experience, not mine. And I think it's a very important distinction to make that it's not me. I don't think Jesus ever called attention to himself personally, but he was the teacher. He was one who had that insight that not a lot of people around him apparently had. And I don't think even the followers that were close to him understood what he was talking about. There were probably a few, but they probably did not make it into scripture or uh, didn't make the local headlines or anything like that. So we don't know about them. 
So it's pure speculation on my part about if he had written things down, he could hand it to you and say, this is the way, this is what I teach. Not me, here it is. But I think it makes sense that that uh, could happen. The alternative is to assume Jesus, the man, is the one and only way to God. A careful study of the sayings attributed to Jesus reveals the way is built on the understanding of God as omnipresent, centered in every individual, in a relationship of eternal oneness that can never be broken. We can never damage our relationship to God. And I think that's what he tried to convey. Sin then was a big deal. Sin today is a big deal. As I said, it's a big business. Without it, Christianity wouldn't work. You've got to have sin to make it work. Jesus, I believe, saw the individual soul as free of sin, not bound by that at all. And when he said to a woman or to a man that your sins are forgiven, he wasn't saying, I have the power to do that. He was just speaking the truth. You don't have, you're not bound by sin, except in your own brain. So there were times when people would be able to release that. Release that, repent, like we talked about last week. Change the mind. That's not me. I'm not bound by sin. So I can take up my bed and walk. And there's a... See, when you put it in that perspective, Jesus was a man. They had the same abilities you and I have. He was more aware than the average person at the spiritual level. But as he said, the things I do, you can do also in greater things. And that's a pretty profound statement. I think that's a, an original statement from Jesus because it totally contradicts everything in mainstream Christian thought. How could the one and only Son of God say that the things I do, you can do also, and greater things? It doesn't make sense. It only makes sense because Jesus said it, and then it was modified later. They tried to fit it. It's like putting the, the square peg in a round hole. They did a little bit of whittling to get it in there. But I believe that's an original saying. Any mystic would say that. It's just like a good piano teacher would say to their student, the things I do, you can do also. That's why I'm here, to try to help you learn to open up your own potential. And you can do greater things. That's what any good teacher would say to their student. That's what any mystic would say to their following. What I'm telling you is within your reach. That's the message. That's the important insight. So the Chinese Tao, and I've covered this before, because I think it's fascinating. It's also referred to as the way. It is described as the natural order of the universe. If a person is in tune with it, their life works. If they are out of tune with it, things don't go so well. Jesus was not a Taoist, of course. But all spiritual systems of truth rest upon the exact same principles. There's a flow. There's a natural way things work. And we can't explain that intellectually, but we can experience it intuitively and align ourselves with it intuitively. So we go more by feeling, and I'm not talking about emotion. I'm talking about something deeper than emotion. It's an inner knowing. It's the thing, again, that took you out of mainstream, out of the mainstream flow and brought you into an alternative approach. You followed something intuitively. There wasn't any road signs that said, turn right, turn left, whatever. You heard something, you liked it, you responded to it because you knew at some level in yourself that it was true. Jesus pointed out that the truth he taught, the way, would set one free. He told Pilate that his single purpose in life was to teach this truth to others. Those who had already gained an understanding of it would resonate with what he was teaching. And I think that's uh, absolutely true, that uh, he understood that 
the greatest gift he could give to humanity was to help them wake up to themselves. Not join a religion, you know, not follow the law, not make sure you wash your hands before you eat or do whatever, not uh, don't heal on the Sabbath or whatever. All that's secondary. Most important thing a person can do is awaken to the presence of God within. That would be the conclusion he would reach. What can I do to help this world? How can I make it a better place? It's possible that he was the son of a stone mason, not a carpenter. There's now debate on translation of that term. Having been in the house building business myself with my father, I was not on the business end of it, I was more a laborer. But I felt I could give a lot more in ministry than I could building houses. I share a lot of the same kinds of experiences I think Jesus probably had, the struggle that he, should I go into a business that will probably pay me a pretty good salary, or should I get into this ministry thing that has a lot of uncertainties, but I feel more my heart is, that's where my heart is. That's how I think I can help people. I think that's what he struggled with in the wilderness when he was baptized by John, went off, did this 40-day uh, meditation period. It wasn't a struggle with the devil. It was a struggle with his lesser self. Should I do what I really think is right, or should I do what will pay me the best? And we probably all have dealt with that issue. So I part company with the mainstream Christian dogma that considers Jesus as the only way to God. This tradition teaches God is afar, man or humankind is born in sin, and God and man are separate by sin, separated by sin, with Jesus as the only way to oneness with God. And you'll see these signs everywhere, Jesus is the only way. I was listening to an a interview with a couple of uh, traditional ministers that were absolutely Jesus is the only way. Well, what if you're a Hindu? Well, you've got to find him or you're not going to make it. Uh, what if you're a Buddhist? Same thing. There's only one way. And it's uh, the Catholics kind of work around that. You know, if you have a good heart, your chances are good. God will give you maybe a not quite as cushy place, but, you know, something. You'll make it somehow. But anyway. That's their problem to work out. We don't have that problem. Jesus says, why do you call me good? And I think that's one of the most profound questions that's raised in Scripture. Coming from Jesus, why do you call me good? Why do you call me the only way? I think that he would say the same thing about that question. Why do you call me good? No one is good but God alone. I'm absolutely convinced that Jesus taught there is only one way to God, and that is not through Him, but through His teachings. That doesn't mean you have to be exposed to His teachings, but what He taught embodies the way. That's go within. And any mystic would say it. The kingdom of God is within you. The way involves the omnipresence and accessibility of God to all. The divine nature of each person and the relationship of absolute oneness between God and the individual. Okay, Tommy in Sydney, Australia, I hope that answers your question. And if you have another, let me know. Uh, to all of our YouTube audience, to all of you, our audience here at home, uh, I love getting up and talking about something that's on your mind. When I write, it's kind of a monologue. It's a self-conversation. But when I speak, I would like it to be a dialogue. I'd like it to be between myself and you. So anytime something comes up, it doesn't matter. If I can answer it, I'll try to. I'll do my best. If I can't, I'll tell you that I don't know the answer to that. Go to the Baptist church. <laughs> no, I'd never say that. Thank you for watching this week's program. If you enjoyed this video, please share it with others. We want to reach as many people as we can, and we appreciate your help. If you'd like to help support this ministry, just click the donate card at the top right-hand corner of your screen. 
Your financial support means a lot to us. We have many subjects in our video lineup, so feel free to take a look. If there's a topic you don't see and would like me to address, just put it in the comment section. I'd love to know what's on your mind. To subscribe to this channel, simply click our logo. Thanks again for your interest in Independent Unity, and have a wonderful week.